Harriet Tubman, Chapter 7, Shuck This Corn. It was the fall of the year. The corn and wheat were being harvested. The harvesting of the corn was, traditionally, the occasion for rejoicing. The days were getting shorter. The nights were perceptibly cooler. The year was turning toward the Christmas season and the long holiday, which the entire countryside would celebrate, both the masters and the slaves. In Dorchester County, there were parties on the big plantations. The clink of glasses, the sound of singing, carriages arriving at the big house. In the fields, late in the day, afternoon merging into night, a corn husking bee was in progress on the Brodus plantation. The corn had been stacked in a great mound. The master had invited his friends to send their slaves to help shuck the corn. The slaves had mounded the corn up higher and higher. <clears throat> And higher, dark hands lifting the ears of corn, slight rustle from the ears, two or three hundred slaves moving around the great stack. When the corn was mounted up, the best singer among the slaves, the one with the highest, clearest, truest voice, climbed to the top of the stack and led off the singing. The song was always improvised, except for the repeated O oh, O oh, O oh of the chorus. There was something wild and beautiful about this singing. The sun was going down, the feel of frost in the air, and the knowledge that once the song was done, they would husk the corn, swiftly singing something else, hands moving in time to the beat of whatever the new song would be. A song in praise of the land, the harvest, a kind of prop propiate, pro propitiation to the land, and a song of thanksgiving too. <clears throat> Master's slaves are slick and fat, oh, oh, oh. Shine just like a beaver hat, oh, oh, oh. Refrain. <clears throat> Turn out here and shuck this corn, oh, oh, oh. Biggest pile seen since I was born, oh, oh, oh. Barrett's slaves are lean and thin, oh, oh, oh. Can, can put their food on the end of a pin, oh, oh, oh. Turn out here and shuck this corn, oh, oh, oh. Biggest pile seen since I was born, oh, oh, oh. One of Barrett's slaves stood silent at the foot of the big pile of corn. Harriet watched him, aware that the overseer was watching him too. A silent slave was not liked by overseers, because a silent slave was probably brooding about escape or revolt. He might have persuaded the others to take part in whatever it was that he was plotting. He might be another Denmark Vesey or Nat Turner. She watched him and felt a prickle of fear run through her. As the last high-pitched rhythmic o o o rang out across the field, the slaves set to work husking the corn, racing with each other to see who could husk the most in the shortest possible time. They started singing a new song, its tempo faster and faster. The movement of their hands paced to the rhythm of the song, and the sound of the rustling of the husks of the corn like an accompaniment. Harriet watched Barrett's slaves her own hands moving swiftly, stripping the husks from the corn, enjoying the fading light, the coolness that lay over the, over the land, the look of the cornfield now that the crop was harvested, noticing all these things and working, and yet watching the big young man who stood silent, whose hands moved slowly, desultory. She leaned over to pick up an ear of corn, and when she looked for him, he was moving away. His swiftly moving figure was in strange contrast to the lingorious slow motion of his hands just a few minutes before. The overseer did not see him until he was halfway across the field. He called to him, ordering him to come back. The big young man kept going, faster now. The overseer followed him, the black snake whip in his hand. Harriet went too. There would be trouble. She knew there was going to be trouble. She could always tell when it was coming, by the peculiar fluttering of her heart. It was a warning signal and it was telling her now that something dreadful was going to happen. They went down one of the old rolling roads, the slave running and the overseer running too. It was not on horseback. He had not expected trouble, in the middle of a husking bee, an occasion for frolicking and fun. Harriet followed close behind. The slave ducked inside the door of the store at the crossroads. The overseer went after him. Harriet heard him say that he would whip him right then and there and thus teach him not to run away from his work. He called for help to tie the slave. He ordered Slay Harriet to help him hold him. She did not move. She stood there just inside the door watching these two. The overseer could not hope 
to whip the slave unless someone helped tie him up. The big young man who belonged to Barrett dodged past the overseer, head down, and was through the door and gone just that fast. Harry had moved in front of the doorway and stood there, blocking it. The overseer, startled by this sudden obstructing body planted squarely in the doorway, turned away from the door, picked up a two a two pound weight from the counter, and hurled it at the fleeing slave. <clears throat> The wave missed the slave. It struck Harriet in the forehead, leaving a great open gash there. She was thrown backward from the force of the blow. She was brought back to the quarter, unconscious, bleeding. In the quarter, the slaves came to look at her. They said that she would surely die. No one could survive with a great hole in the head like that. With the good, warm blood, the life's blood draining out, so much blood. Even Brodus came to look at her and couldn't conceal his dismay at the sight of her. Old Rit hovered over her, a prayer on her lips. Not this child. She couldn't lose this one. Two of her girls had already been sold already. Sold south. Part of the chain gang. Crying, protesting, pulling back, and the chains pulling them forward. Clanking sounds of the chains, cracking sound of the whip of the driver. Old Rit nursed Harriet, alone, unaided. She even called the, in the old man that said... They could conjure, though she doubted that they had any that any conjurer in the world could save this child. At night, in the flickering light from the fire, it seemed to her that the wound, that great hole in the forehead, throbbed. That night, in the slave cabins in the quarter, they talked about Harriet. If she lived, she would be sold south. The overseer and the master would not keep an intractable, defiant slave, a slave who refused to help the overseer tie up a runaway blocking the door like Harriet said, did. She would be sold. It was a dangerous thing that she had done. Dangerous, yes, but a brave thing, too. Why wasn't she afraid? What had made her so bold? And someone spoke of Denmark Vesey. We are slaves. And Denmark's answer? You deserve to be. The corn husking was forgotten, the fun of it. The singing, the capering that had gone on while they husked the corn. Ghosts wandered in the quarter, whispered in the quarter. Denmark Bessie and Nat Turner haunted the big house, too. The master couldn't sleep. He kept listening, wondering. Were they plotting something out there in the quarter? Why were they so quiet? Or were they? The air seemed to be filled with whispering voices. Night after night, the slaves kept creeping into the cabin to look at Harriet. They knew that the overseer was trying to sell her trying to sell this dozing, half-conscious young girl who never moved from the pallet on the floor. November came and passed. Then it was Christmas. Harriet was in a stupor most of the time, deaf to the laughter, the dancing and singing, deaf to the clack of the bones, the beat of the juba. Right after Christmas, the overseer began again, trying to sell her. Neighboring farmers came and looked at her and snorted their refusal to buy her. Some of them laughed and said Brodus was crazy to sell such a wreck. Others said he would have to pay them to take her off his hands. Not worth a sixpence. Seller? Ha! <clears throat> Harriet stayed in the cabin from Christmas until March, and toward the end of this long period of inert inertness, she began to pray for the conversation of Edward Brodus, repeating the same prayer over and over again. Change his heart, Lord. Convert him. In March, too, when it was obvious that she was getting better, she learned that she and her brothers were to be sold south, part of the next chain gang. Austin Woodfolk, the slave trader, was in Cambridge, and Brodus had arranged for her sale. The knowledge that she would be sold terrified her. There was always an ache in her skull, a pounding, the wound that had healed, but it was still painful. She was subject to violent headaches. What was worse, she never knew at what moment she would suddenly go to sleep. It was though she lost consciousness. She never knew when this would happen or for how long a period of time. When she slept like that, she could not be roused. It was like a coma. She could remember what had gone on just before the period of unconsciousness, could pick up a conversation, the threads of it. If she was talking, if she was talking herself, when she suddenly went to sleep, she would finish whatever she was going to say when she awakened. But she was going to be sold, going to be sold. She changed the prayer that she said every night. She no longer prayed for the master's converse, conversion. She said, Lord, if you're never going to change that man's heart, kill him, Lord, and take him out of the way. Kill him, Lord, 
She said it over and over again. She knew she could not survive that trip south with the chain gang. Survive the slave driver's whip. She might suddenly go to sleep. She was unable to move when she went into that curious trance-like sleep. She would be beaten. She would die on the road, on that old slave road that ran straight on down into the deep south. She thought she could hear the clank of the chains, could see her brothers watching her die, unable to do anything about it. Kill him, Lord, she prayed. She knew she couldn't run away. She might be found sitting sound asleep, not a mile from the plantation, motionless by the side of the road in plain view. A few days later, she heard that Edward Brodus, the master, was sick, that the doctor had told the family he would surely die. His body servant whispered the word to the mistress' personal maid, who told the kitchen help, who relayed the message to the coachman, who told one of the stable boys, who told one of the children, who ran like the wind to tell Harriet and Old Rit. The message was transmitted mouth to ear, ear to mouth, with gestures made by swift moving hands that showed just how sick the master was. And then suddenly, one morning, the master was dead. The field hands knew he was dead before the overseer knew it, and no one watching them could really have said how the news spread so fast. The length and breadth of the whole plantation, though the word went from the master's bedroom to the kitchen, then to the stable, then to the quarter, where the little children managed to tell the field hands while they brought the water to them. It was planting time, and the backs of the field hands were bent as they leaned over the long rows, sun glistening on their bare backs. Seed time. Seed time. The overseer, a man on horseback watching them, suddenly shouted, Make a noise there, because a hush fell over the field. They began to sing, but it was a slow-moving song, pitched higher than anything he had ever heard with a wail in it that made him shiver, and the words made him shiver too. He no moonrise, he no starrise, but he done laying his body down. Old master will walk in the moonlight, he'll walk in the starlight to lay his body down. Old master will walk in the graveyard, he'll walk through the graveyard to lay his body down. Old master will lie in the grave, stretch out his arms to lay his body down. Old Rit told Harriet that the master was dead. She didn't need to tell her, when Harriet heard that long, slow wail from the fields, she knew he was dead. She lay on the floor of the cabin, motionless, conscience-stricken, filled with horror. She believed that her prayers had killed him. In Boston, on January 1, 1831, William Lloyd Garrison published the first issue of his anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator. The following statement appeared on the front page of the first issue. I will be harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice on this subject, slavery. I do not want to think or write with moderation. No, no. And that is the end of chapter 7.